everyone and, and welcome those of you who are uh, uh, attending this lecture or this event online today. We're very fortunate to uh, be holding today one of our favorite events of the year, and that is the Mellon Colloquium. Uh, we are, uh, it, it's been a fine thing for the last more than 20 years that because of a, a substantial endowment, a generous endowment from the Mellon Foundation, we are able to bring into the New Deal Institute every year a young scholar who is an assistant professor at a university and working toward tenure and needs to have some time off to work on a book manuscript. Uh, and we're able to bring scholars in from a number of different disciplines uh, from year to year uh, who, who spend the year working on a book manuscript and participating in the life of the Medieval Institute. Um, this is the 21st of our Mellon Colloquia, uh, and the colloquium will be focused around the work of this year's Mellon Fellow, Mireille Pardon, uh, who we'll meet in just a few moments. Um, Mireille is a, has a PhD from Yale University and is a, now a faculty member at Berea College in Kentucky. Um, she is a scholar of social and uh, history in, in uh, northern France, Flanders, and um, is, uh, has been here working um, on, um, and will speak to us today. I don't know if this is the title of your book or not. I think it is. You think it is. Yeah, so we'll see, we'll see what you say. Yeah. <laughs> this is the, the title, the working title of her book, um, the, and she'll be our first speaker. The Invention of Homicide, Crime, Honor, and Spectacular Justice. That sounds really interesting. <laughs> spectacular Justice okay. in Late Medieval Flanders. So, uh, Mireille, you have the floor. So, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, and thank you to the Medieval Institute for hosting this colloquium and, of course, to the Mellon Fellowship as well. Uh, let me get my PowerPoint up here. <laughs> yeah, some, some rather dramatic images. <laughs> um, I also wanted to take a moment before I start just to thank our three distinguished discussants who have come, in some cases, a rather long way uh, to talk about my work um, and the things that they're working on. Uh, when I first started this fellowship back in the fall, um, I asked Megan Hall, the assistant director of the Medieval Institute, who I should also thank for all of her work organizing the event. Um, I asked her, when you say I can invite anyone to this colloquium, does that actually mean anyone? Um, and it turns out that it did. So what an amazing gift to be able to say, I want to invite these three scholars from various places around the world to talk about the subjects that I find most interesting. And what an even greater gift that all of them agreed to come. So thank you. Um, so in some ways, it's a bit difficult to distill a whole book project into a 20 minute talk. Uh, so let me tell you just briefly my plan for today. Um, I'd like to start by telling you a little bit about the initial archival finds that made me so interested to start thinking about the perception of homicide in 15th century Flanders. Um, and then we'll talk about the significance of these observations for understanding judicial practice at the end of the Middle Ages. And finally, I'll end with a brief overview of some of the different chapters of my draft. So, death in the archives. In 1402, in the liberty of Bruges, Pierre, son of Gilmes, killed two ducks that did not belong to him. <laughs> the bailiff, Thomas Schoenfeldt, accepted a composition payment of three livres from Pierre, which was recorded in the financial account of his office. This is what the bailiff accounts look like. Um, the bailiff was the primary law enforcement official in a Flemish city, or in the case of the liberty of Bruges, an outlying castellany. Three times a year, the bailiff submitted his financial records to the Chamber of Accounts, connecting local judicial practice in Flanders with the Burgundian administrative apparatus. Um, the medieval Flanders was part of the Burgundian Netherlands, the Dukes of Burgundy having gained the county of Flanders in 1384. Bailiff accounts recorded all the money taken in and given out by his office, including any fines that he collected. The specific type of fine that Pierre paid was called a composition payment. And so a composition payment is kind of like you're settling out of court or you're settling with the state. Um, and it's a, you know, the amount is negotiated between the suspect and directly with the bailiff, and it can take point at any point in the judicial process. So there can just be a rumor that someone is suspected of maybe doing something, and they can make a composition payment to avoid a prosecution, or the trial could actually start it. Bailiff composition payments were quite common in medieval Flanders, and bailiffs have accepted them for a wide range of offenses, killing your neighbor's ducks, in the case of Pierre, but also letting your animals wander onto someone else's land, selling bread outside of market weight regulations, calling your neighbor a thief, 
or going into your neighbor's house and stealing something. Deserting a waterway, blocking the path, negligently letting your house catch on fire, but also capital offenses such as homicide. In the same year that Thomas Schoenfeld collected a composition payment from Pierre for killing two ducks, he also collected one from Jacques Depart. Quote, because of his horse, which dragged his servant over the field from which the aforementioned servant was so injured that he died a brief time later. He collected a composition payment from Jean Le Boutinard as well for having, quote, injured one named Poitier from which wounding he went from life by passing. In this case, the death occurred in the context of a fight, which he describes as a heated battle. So I'm really interested in this sort of more passive way of describing legal violence. Uh, because Pierre definitely killed those two ducks. We have sort of a very clear active verb, devoir tué. Um, but Jacques' horse injured someone such that they later died. And while fighting Boitier, Jean gave him a wound from which he later departed life. And this sort of passive language is common for killings that resulted in a bail of composition payment and contrasts to the language in records of execution. Deaths that resulted in an execution were described with things like the homicide or an active verb to kill, or someone could be condemned as a murderer, comme murderer. This is especially noteworthy because of the prevalence of composition payments as a way to resolve homicide cases. Um, these are statistics from 1450, 1450 to 1520. Um, yeah. So what does it mean for such a large portion of homicide cases to be described this way? What does it mean for how people interpreted the act of killing in general? And what would it, especially, what would it mean for this language to start to change? Because towards the end of the period I'm looking at, so in the late 15th and early 16th century, you start seeing more and more bailiffs using active language to describe lethal violence, especially death in mutual combat, while the more passive language remains with more sort of accidental deaths. Um, it's not always someone losing control of their horse, but it often is, strangely. Um, so this is sort of the initial archival observation that maybe you want to pursue this project further. And I will say that sometimes I do sort of wonder if I'm making a mountain out of a molehill by focusing on these issues of grammatical structures and passive versus active language in homicide cases. Um, but to briefly talk about uh, sort of modern language, modern American news often uses the phrase officer involved shooting to describe incidents where someone was shot and killed by the police. On March 15, 2020, two days after police shot Rihanna Taylor in her apartment in Louisville, Kentucky, that's how local news initially reported her death. And that sounds quite different from the language used on June 20th, 2020, when People Magazine released a piece with the title, Brianna Taylor's mom wants charges against police who killed her daughter. It also sounds quite different from the language used in August, 2022, after the officers involved were charged, when um, ACLU Kentucky reported the headline, officers charged for Brianna Taylor's murder. These three headlines all describe the same event, but they sound quite different. And the use of language, sort of active or passive, is part of that. In the past few years, there has been a lot of debate around the term officer involved shooting and the prevalence of passive terminology more generally to describe police violence in the media. In 2020, the Associated Press adapted their guidelines to discourage the term, though it's actually still quite common. Um, these are all um, articles from last week. Um, so this is obviously a much larger issue and not the subject of this talk, but I did want to bring it up just briefly because sometimes 15th century judicial practice can feel very far away from us, but issues of how we describe lethal violence are not. Okay, so we have the shift in language used to describe killings resolved through composition payments during the period 1400 to 1520. Why does this matter and how does it relate to broader issues in late medieval judicial practice? In, late, in 15th century Flanders, there were a lot of different ways to resolve a violent dispute. Many cases ended in a composition payment negotiated with the bailiff, as previously discussed, but even if a case ended up being heard by the urban alderman, punishments of the body, be they corporal or capital, were not the most likely results. Instead, financial penalties, banishments, reconciliatory rituals like penitential pilgrimage and the honorable amends dominated urban justice. And even if a capital sentence was given, letters of remission spared many from the, quote, rigor of justice. Both remissions and composition payments often relied on another form of resolution, the peace agreement. Um, so this is a composition payment that two brothers made where they sort of very formally say that, you know, according to the privileges of liberty, according to sort of our customary law, um, if they're judged, the result would be decapitation. If they show up to court, if they don't show up to court, they'll be banished. But also that we're going to allow a composition payment specifically because peace was made with the opposing party. While killing was eligible for capital punishment, an eye for an eye justice was rarely carried out. 
Only the very worst murderers faced the hangman, and many more killers found a way, albeit sometimes at great expense, to reconcile with those they had harmed and be accepted back into the community. However, in the 15th century, things were starting to shift a little bit. Though peace agreements had long coexisted with centralized judicial procedures, they declined over time. At the same time, composition payments for homicide and other offenses became less common. Um, and this is 1450 to 1520, um, the number of composition payments accepted for common homicide during that period declining. Financial penalties and sanctions that aimed to reintegrate the offender back into the community were replaced with, by corporal and capital punishments. Um, and this is something that corresponds to a wider trend across uh, continental Europe, um, but this is specifically for these four jurisdictions in Flanders, um, and this is the number of payments made to the executioner for carrying out bodily punishments, both corporal and capital, and as your composition payments are declining, these are increasing. Um, but anyway, this is sort of a broader trend across many European judicial systems from the 14th through 16th centuries, where physical shame-based punishments begin to take a more central role in judicial systems. Scholars sometimes emphasize the connection between this judicial pageantry, sort of spectacular justice, and early modern state building. Whether it's Peter Spierenberg's Spectacle of Suffering, Richard von Drummond's Theater of Horror, or even Michel Foucault's Spectacle of the Scaffold, the visible spectacle of judicial ritual showed the power of the prince by publicly punishing the body of the condemned. As part of this movement from reconciling feuding parties to spectacular justice by the state, scholars of homicide often talk about the criminalization of homicide. So criminalization meant that homicide was consistently condemned and prosecuted with formal judicial procedures instead of peace agreements or more informal processes. Killing had always had consequences, but it was not sort of criminalized um, in this sort of historical narrative until standardized legal procedures and judicial bureaucracies in service of early modern state building fully replaced more medieval patterns of feud and reconciliation. Scholars often locate the criminalization of homicide in Europe in the 16th and 17th centuries. For the Low Countries specifically, a wealth of Habsburg edicts condemned interpersonal violence, while standardized definitions of homicide and murder came through legal treatises in the 16th century. And in 1532, the ratification of the Constitutio Criminalis Carolina by Charles V systematized law across the Holy Roman Empire, including Flanders. Similarly, over the course of the 16th century, new legislation progressively restricted the crimes for which composition payments were possible. In 1522, the Council of Flanders forbade composition payments for cases of homicide committed deliberately. And in 1541, composition was restricted to killing committed in self in by accident or in self-defense. If one accepts a quite wide definition of self-defense, this describes for the most part what was already going on in bailiff compositions in the 15th century. For the jurisdiction studied, these regulations introduced restrictions that were actually already being followed in practice, as no premeditated killings appear past 1480, and compositions for killing in general decreased a lot after, 15, or after the year 1500. Um, so the chart on the slide here is just comparing sort of composition versus execution for homicide cases in the first century of the 15th century versus the first century of the 16th century. All of these legal changes, the restriction of composition, new princely edicts, um, legal treatises by people like Baumhauer and Willett, this progressive criminalization came after changes in judicial practice. In the beginning of the 16th century, bailiffs were technically still allowed to accept composition payments for homicide, but very few did so, and the ones that were accepted were almost all for accidental death. Given that legal changes follow changes in practice, perhaps we should be thinking more about bottom-up cultural changes and how people thought about homicide in addition to criminalization from above. Um, and that's why I think this terminology used to describe killing in legal records might be important. Before there was a criminalization of homicide by the state through legislation to rein in feud and revenge killings, homicide was invented through a change in how people perceived the act of killing. It is this sort of cultural shift, more an invention than criminalization, that is the focus of my book project. New ways of thinking about lethal violence changed the landscape of urban justice, and the communal negotiative practices that characterized medieval justice gave way to the rise of early modern spectacular punishment. Um, so that's the basic thesis of the book. Um, so this, in this transition from reconciliation to punishment, perhaps we rely too much on narratives of state building and ignore bottom-up cultural changes related to the perception of homicide. Um, now I'd like to pivot towards the book itself and give a very brief outline of the chapters that would hopefully sort of further elucidate this thesis. Um, chapter one is pretty introductory and it's kind of already things that I've sort of mentioned in terms of sort of um, different forms of judicial practice that are going on in these areas and also the, these movement away from more reconciliatory systems and the rise of bodily punishment. Chapter two looks at what conditions made violence look sympathetic. 
So bailiff compositions and letters of remission are sources that sort of tell us what kind of the best case scenario is, um, how to make someone seem as sympathetic as possible when you're describing something they did that's very definitely against the law. And these sorts of sources often emphasize the pro-social behavior of the perpetrator, that they made peace with the family of the victim, and often that they were embedded in a traditional family unit themselves. The ideal perpetrator was responding to provocation according to contemporary understandings of self-defense, a very wide concept stretching all the way from threats to one's life to seeking vengeance for attacks on one's family. In many cases, the persistent aggression of the victim, allegedly at least, had forced the perpetrator to respond in line with contemporary frameworks of honor. These same tropes are flipped on their head to then denigrate the character of the victim. While the perpetrator had responded logically to an attack, the aggression of the victim had no clear cause. The hostility of the perpetrator was situational, while the victim was, ideally, customarily violent and did not act in alignment with commonly understood codes of behavior. These narratives of excusable violence versus unrestrained aggression are fairly consistent for conflicts between men, while women often relied on different narratives to explain their violent behavior. Cells are all largely qualitative, but there are also some interesting, more quantitative differences in composition payments versus executions. Um, namely, the way that composition payments for homicide allow someone to spread blame over an entire group, even if some of those people were only slightly involved or even just present when someone died. In some ways, having accomplices may have even looked better because it presented violence as a socially embedded act, as opposed to inherently antisocial behavior. So chapter three contrasts the perception of violence with the perception of theft. Um, and patterns discussed for homicide are sort of the opposite for theft, in that loan thieves are more likely to pay make composition payments, while bands of brigands face execution. <laughs> theft as a crime is associated with dishonesty that detracted from the common good at any level, whereas violence could be connected with positive social values, family, honor, and self-defense. Theft was always antisocial behavior, but a perpetrator of violence could point out the antisocial behavior of his victim in order to excuse his actions. In these situations, the violence was against the law, but was framed in a way that did not reflect poorly on the character of the perpetrator. Because theft was a moral failing, it was associated with diabolical temptation and material greed. The ideal thief, in terms of mitigating circumstances, portrayed his act as a momentary lapse in judgment, perhaps even saying he was led astray by others as accomplices. So while chapters two and three present a fairly static view of late medieval cultural ideas about criminality, chapter four tracks how these paradigms shifted from the beginning of the 15th to the beginning of the 16th centuries. Over time, bailiffs began to assign guilt more individually in cases of lethal violence, and these, the statistical patterns that once so distinguished property crimes from violence start to fade away. Peacemaking also ceases to play such a large role in the formal prosecutions, as judicial systems became more interested in punishment over pacification. If chapter four tracks a change, then chapter five is interested in why these changes were occurring. So, Florida cities have a long history of revolutionary activity, um, but concerns over public disturbances were not limited to the fear of urban revolt. And so chapter five looks at the rhetoric of the common good in political discourse and urban literature um, in relation to that of legal records that justified prosecutions in the name of preserving the urban peace. Um, in cases where someone threatened to throw their neighborhood into disarray, the community itself was framed as the victim instead of an individual, a single individual. Um, so these are just two examples of that. Um, you have three men being banished from Ghent uh, because they were sort of going around and hitting on people's houses and throwing windows at people's houses, but the problem is not described as the conflict between them and the people inside the houses. It's described as that they were doing all of the sort of noise and rudeness that made the whole neighborhood going uphill. And you see similar language at the end of the 15th century in composition payments as well. It's another sort of altercation where someone's yelling outside someone's house. The person is sort of safely barricaded into their house, probably because they don't want to go outside and get into a physical altercation. Um, but the problem at the end is not necessarily the individuals involved, it's that they're putting, such that they're putting the neighborhood into great disturbance. And I think that this, this cultural interest in the common good and the perceived fragility of the urban peace set the, set the stage for transformation in how people understood homicide. So at the beginning of the 15th century, there were many forms of conflict resolution that made little distinction between accidental death due to negligence and excusable masculine violence in the context of mutual combat. Over the course of the 15th and 16th centuries, the category of death and mutual combat, which made up the bulk of the cases dealt with by the bailiff, drifted away from accidental death and began to be categorized as something closer to murder. This development drove the transitions described in chapter four as the criteria for honorable defensive violence contracted and the demands of the common good fueled the formation of the more punitive judicial system. 
In late medieval Flanders, where great importance was placed on social harmony and the common good, interpersonal violence ceased to be a matter between two individuals or two families, but was considered to be a danger to the community. For much of the 15th century, a feud-like culture guided responses to lethal violence. Bailiff compositions describe homicides as the unfortunate but not unexpected result of a fight, for which everyone in the fight could share culpability. Homicide lagged behind other crimes in terms of the idea of a public crime, as seen through the tradition of large-scale familial reconciliation ceremonies and the prominence of familial groups in bailiff composition payments. Yet over time, the excusability of masculine violence declined and guilt rested solely on the individual with active language describing the lethal act. At the same time, systems favoring negotiation, such as settlements between families and compositions with the bailiff, declined, and the last vestiges of youth culture fell away through a cultural shift, reconfiguring concepts of guilt and honor, violence in the family. The image of defensive masculine violence necessitated by the demands of honor and familial ties and eligible for social reintegration faded before the image of the murderer. Um, and it is the sort of image of the murderer that I'd like to end on, um, because that's another aspect of language in these legal records that I find interesting. Composition payments are sources that describe something that someone did, um, be it stole a goose or injured a man such that death ensued. Uh, but records of execution sometimes describe what someone is. Uh, so this is a record of a payment um, for execution in Bruges, where uh, the executioner is being paid for cutting off someone's head as a murderer, not because he killed someone, but because he just sort of is a murderer. Um, and the sort of language of as a murderer or as a highway robber never appears in records of composition or banishment. Um, this is also rhetoric that obscures the name of the victim. If you say someone is being punished because they killed someone else, you need to at least say, some, you could just say someone else and leave it ambiguous, but often there is sort of a place there in order to put someone's name. Um, whereas if you're executing someone as a murderer, you don't really sort of need that for the sentence to make sense. Uh, Comme stripped the condemned of his identity within the community and defined him only in terms of his crime. He was not a man who killed, but a killer. We began this presentation with a story about animals, the two ducks that Pierre paid a fine for killing in 1402, so I'd like to end it in the same way. In 1496, in the Liberty of Bruges, two pigs were executed for having killed a child. The execution of animals for homicide is not incredibly common, but it did occur in medieval and early modern Europe. Some scholars see this as evidence that animals might have been granted some degree of legal personhood in medieval law. I'm not personally entirely convinced of that, but I do see the opposite going on here. Not the humanization of animal killers, but the bestialization of the human killer. Composition payments very much hinged on the recognition of the humanity of the accused, their honor, their familial connections, their hot anger in response to an attack, their reconciliation with the family of the victim. A pig can do none of those things. In contrast, um, execution is an act of dehumanization that placed the human killer in the same position as those two pigs. A man who killed is still a man, but a killer can either be animal or human. And this perhaps makes sense, because after all, it's a lot easier to watch the state execute someone when you believe they aren't quite as human as you. Thank you.